Hi guys. Um, yeah, so I've worked with um, innovation in major corporations for the last 15 years and um, mainly focusing on radical innovation, how to make these big giants um, be able to explore new territory and not just explore it, but actually also be able to execute on it. And it's something that's very challenging. And obviously, uh, seeing the pace at which the world is changing, this is something that more and more organizations um, will have to adapt and understand. So um, this is what I'm going to share with you a little about today. Um, I left um, the big corps um, earlier this year to found my own company called Diplomatic Rebels, and I'm going to talk a little about what that means as well. Um, but basically to be able to see how can I, how can I help more organizations um, through this journey. But let me start by, um, by telling you um, a little story um, of a company uh, called Lego. And let me see, how many of you have heard of Lego? <laughs> Great, that's, that's awesome. How many of you have played with Lego when you were a child? Oh, that's, that's close to 100%. Yeah, I'm going to take you up on that one. Um, how many of you have kids that are playing with Lego? Fantastic, thanks guys. Um, and now for a more tricky one, how many of you are still playing with Lego? Come on, be honest guys. <laughs> Great, thanks. And it's, it's amazing to see the amount of, of adults that are very passionate about the product and the brand, even when they don't have kids living at home anymore. And we call them uh, AFOLs, adult fans of Lego, and they are actually in the millions out there. And they're a very important part of not just the um, the ecosystem in the community, but also the way that the company develops new products and experiences, and I'm going to talk a bit about that. So the LEGO has been uh, on an amazing journey uh, the last 10 to 15 years, grown more than 400% in the last 10 years, doing amazingly. And recently, actually, um, the last three years has been the most powerful brand in the world, which to me is still completely amazing. How can a relatively small toy manufacturer from Denmark be the most powerful brand in the world. More powerful than, yeah, you can see Google, Ferrari, Nike. And um, I'm gonna share a little about why I believe, why I believe that is true. But I'm also gonna share a, a bit of a story of, um, of how, how, um, how the past showed that that is not guaranteed. Because actually, it's not just, it's not more than 13 years ago that the company almost went bankrupt. Um, and what happened was that during the 90s and early 2000s, the company had a, a pretty strong brand because it's done very well throughout the uh, 70s and 80s. But the top line was sort of fluctuating quite a bit. So um, they had a hard time sort of hitting successes more, more sort of sustainably. And, um, and the profits weren't, do, do, weren't doing too well. So they, um, they had some... Um, so I was going to say brilliant, but I'm just going to say they had some uh, consultants flown in um, from some big consultancy houses. And what, what, obviously what they helped when, with them uh, was to say, well, you know, you have a strong brand, um, but you're not doing too well in turnover. You need to diversify. You need to leverage your brand uh, power. So the company started doing that. When it started developing new products and experiences, um, it created clothing lines, food lines, theme parks, um, did a lot of other type of toys, uh, more like what the competition was doing, mechanical toys, etc. And, um, and then 2003 happened. And basically the company almost went over the, the, the cliff um, for two main reasons. One was that the company had sort of placed some big bets in completely new directions <laughs> without really understanding which way it was going not really understanding where it was coming from and why it existed, why it was so strong in the first place. So um, cost exploded, didn't really have the capabilities to do it. But secondly, and what was worse, was that the customers, which the kids and the parents, lost sight of who the company was and who the products, you know, what, the, what a Lego experience was. So they started opting for all kinds of other experiences. So the company almost went bankrupt. Actually, Merrill Lynch flew over um, from the States and told the owner, you know, this is it, give up, um, sell out uh, um, now when you still can. The owner refused, put in all his spare cash, which was about $400 million at that point, um, saved the company sort of at the brink of time, 
And, and one of the things that, that he realized was that we need to stick to the brick. We need to understand what is our core, what is it that we are truly good at. And from that, I, I sort of picked up a couple of things that I believe to be absolutely key for effective innovation. Because what the company basically did was innovate itself almost to death by starting to do a lot of things that it, that it probably shouldn't do or that it didn't know how to do. And the, its approach to how to do it was also um, very risky. So, so the first thing is to really understand the mission that you're on as a company. And this sounds quite simple, but really understand why do we exist? What is the purpose of our company? And make that purpose something that people can get passionate about. And this, not, is, this is not only just about understanding who you are as a company, but it's also how to make other people understand what it is you're doing and why you're, why you're trying to, to achieve the things you're trying to achieve. Um, the second one is to understand the core DNA. What is it that, that you do uniquely well? What are your core capabilities? Um, but look at this beyond the existing products and services that, that are there today. Look at it more long term. What is it that, that we tr truly deliver to this world and, and the impact that we have? And with those two in place, then you can set a strategy that's way stronger in terms of understanding how do we then achieve this. And with those in hand, the innovation strategy will come way stronger. And this is what Lego didn't really have in place. They had a strong brand that meant they could sell almost anything they thought. And, and I guess they could to some extent. Um, but they couldn't manage it very well. So um, at Lego, after the crisis, they set themselves this mission. They said, what we are in the world to do is to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. As a, and as you notice, this has nothing to do with the company itself. This has only to, um, to do with the users they want to impact. And it's also about, it's not just about, you know, it's not, it's not really about financial results. It's really about having an impact. Because what this means is that empower future generations of kids with creative confidence. They could become makers and builders and creators and hackers and coders and leaders of the world. And that's something that everybody at LEGO is super passionate about. So if you ask any of the 19,000 employees today at Lego, why do you work here? You know, select the seasoned factory worker. He will say something like this. Not the same words, but he'll say, well, it's really about the kids. It's really about empowering these new generations of kids. And so that not, not only does it make the employees very passionate, it makes the whole community very passionate. All these adult fans, they're there because of this, because this is what they believe in as well. And they're passionate about it. And the same with the partners and the, and the customers, the retailers. So this has become very impactful for the company in also looking beyond the existing products and services because this talks more than about just toys. This talks more than, than, than the existing brick system. The second thing is when we innovate at Lego, we, we have the saying, it has to be obviously Lego but never seen before. And that means that customers, I mean, kids and families should be able to spot miles away that this is clearly a legal product, but never seen before. And we use this formula, and it doesn't mean there have to be a physical brick. The brick is more like a symbol for what, what is the DNA of a legal experience. It can be purely digital, it can be um, something else as well, but, but it should still have that essence of a Lego experience. But obviously the world is changing, and it's easier to stay true to yourself when you're only doing incremental innovation. So, so when you have to do more radical innovation, it's a bigger challenge. And, and um, I've been having a saying as well inside of LEGO saying the radical is normal. And what does that mean? It means that the time you have for something is radically new in the market till it's a mainstream commodity gets shorter and shorter. So as a first mover, you have less and less time to recoup on your investment, and as a second mover, you almost have no time to catch up. So that means that every company and organization today needs to be able to work more with radical innovation, meaning adapt to entirely new things and change their own industry. And these are some of the things that are affecting toys right now that are quite obvious, but obviously robotics and artificial intelligence uh, is a big thing. What happens when toys can move the way that kids imagine them to move and they can talk and speak back and they actually grow more intelligent the more you interact with them. There's uh, Internet of Things when toys get connected um, to each other, but also to utilities and screens in the house. Mixed reality when you can augment the physical world while still being 
being in it by still touching the physical world, but you have an augmented layer on top of it. And then we're seeing another trend among millennials, uh, the millennial parents as well as their kids. Um, they actually don't want to be perceived as consumers anymore. Um, they don't just want to consume, they want to co-create. They want to be part of, of creating those experiences. And they want those experiences to be on their terms and not the company terms. Um, and we see this in the maker movement and other places. And obviously 3D printing is an important thing for a company as well, producing physical plastic toys. Because what happens when customers can, can co-create and print their own things in the future? So these things mean that as an organization, we need to also have strong capabilities in exploring these new territories. And incremental innovation within the existing core business won't suffice. So it almost demands a sort of ambidextrous uh, ability to both maintain the existing business and running that without jeopardizing it, at the same time exploring these new territories, but in a, in a low cost, low risk manner. So it demands a, a way of orchestrating this. And um, I, de I define sort of three levels of innovation that should take place in most organizations. And each level depending on the level of risk and uncertainty there is associated with it. And obviously the first level is, is that around the existing core business. This is typically where there is a state skate model in place and that works quite well. And this is continuous improvement where companies are constantly evolving the existing business. Most companies are pretty good at this. Second level is, is what I call core front end. And this means adding entirely new stuff into the existing business. So it has a high level of novelty towards the market. Uh, it seems entirely new, but it's still leveraging the same core capabilities, the same business model, the same operating model, and the same infrastructure in the core company and organization. So it's basically, it's a, basically um, the, same, the same business, but just with a, with a level of innovation. The third level that very few companies does well is that of radical front-end innovation. So adding something entirely new into the business. And this is where the state skate model won't work, where more agile um, methodologies are needed to work. And I've been speaking to um, quite a few executives around this, and, and some of them have the perception that when you're sort of looking into the future and exploring future territories, you have a lot of time. And, um, and if you have that thinking that you know, there's 10, 15 years till this is relevant, so let's build some bigger projects that explore this. And you know, execs also have another tendency that when they want something badly solved, they throw a lot of cash at it. And what happens then is that with more cash, you have more people. And then you have more steering committees and SVPs, and all of a sudden you have a project that's too big to fail. And these projects can then sort of have up through the organization for years before somebody shuts them down. It's very traumatic for the organization. So in fact, when you're doing these projects, you have very little time. And that should be sort of the, the mental perception of this is that create artificial scarcity so that you, work, you run very fast with small teams, less resources, less time um, to really explore these new areas. So we created that in Lego, we created the Lego Future Lab, which basically was a lab that was, that was mandated to explore these new territories. Um, and do it in a way where it didn't disrupt the existing business, but it still would be constantly leveraging the existing organization, and it would also be empowering the existing organization with, with new capabilities and with a new understanding of these areas. About 35 people, international team, working in very small core teams, and, and really being the rebels of the organization, and, um, and using a completely different methodology in terms of working than the rest of the organization. Um, and um, so it, what, what, it, what we started by doing was really build the capability to do agile experimentation, as we called it, which is really about exploring new territory in a very quick and agile manner. And three things I identified as sort of key to, to do agile experimentation. The one of them is how you orchestrate your teams, obviously. So we've been working in very small core teams, um, cross-functional, multidisciplinary, which means that in each team, you have the skeleton capability to take a project from end to end, from the very early research to launch at the end. Uh, a skeleton structure means that they have the, the core capabilities, but they, they don't have all the capabilities. So they would le leverage experts from within the organization and outside the organization to then source the needed skills as they would move along. Second is process, where instead of the, uh, the state skate model, we've been using design thinking, 
an agile methodology and business model innovation in a combination, which means constantly challenging own assumptions by testing them very rapidly um, and, um, and building um, the experiences from there, at the same time challenging the existing business model um, and, and, and exploring those areas. Third one, which is the most overlooked in many organizations, is how you measure the value of these projects. Um, and often you want radical new innovation projects, but you measure them with the same methodology as, as the rest of the organization, which is typically only looking at the end point, and that end point often being a financial result. Instead, what you want to measure is, is the learning that's happening in the projects. And what we did was to look at the maturity level of each project. So a maturity points to how much territory have the project uncovered, how much learning have they captured, how many new capabilities have they built. And that becomes the key performance indicator for these projects, you know, understanding this across the sciability, feasibility, and viability in terms of understanding, is this feasible? Can we do it? Can we execute it? And I believe that that creates the culture of innovation in any organization. And again, speaking to executives, many of them are saying, well, our, our biggest problem is really the culture. There's no culture of innovation. And some of them try to address it head on and say we need to do a cultural turnaround. And that will typically backfire quite hard because if you're saying, you know, we need a cultural turnaround, you're telling people that the way you think, the way you work is wrong, but, but I don't really know how to, how to, what it should be instead. So, as you know, behavior really controls culture, and what controls behavior is the way that you're working. So by changing the way your teams are working together, the way the, your, your processes are run, and the way you measure results, this will really change the, the culture in the organization to much innovation. So our approach has been at LEGO to, start, to think big, but start really small. Have big visions for the future, but what's the smallest possible way we can get started? with the smallest amount of people, the smallest amount of cash, and the least amount of time, how can we explore these new territories? So we scout for trends and technologies, understanding the world, gather insights about what's going on, um, and typically we would be meeting up with 20 to 30 startups every quarter um, within different technology areas, as well as collaborating with major technology companies to understand what's moving, what's going on, and trying to create partnerships around these new areas. Also, we will be spending a lot of time with the, with the users and with the customers. And at LEGO, we had a saying, you know, if you want to understand how the lion hunts, don't go to the zoo, go to the savanna. And that means you need to go to the natural habitat of where your customers are. Because with the amount of changes, you can't just survey them or, or do focus groups and, and, and expect that they have any answers that are useful, because they won't know. Instead, you need to go and observe what's changing in their lives. Um, and for LEGO, we did in-home studies, which means camping out with the families for, for a given period of time to understand what's changing in the families. You know, when do they get up in the morning? What do they eat for breakfast? Do they even eat breakfast? Do they play with any toys around that time? How do they get to school? What happens in the school bus? In the schoolyard, are they bringing any toys? Are they playing together? When they come home, are they bringing home friends? Are they only playing online? And all these things are changing over time. So that's something that happens ongoingly to understand what's changing. And it's not just, um, it's not just your customers, it's also your customers' customers. So for Lego, the customers is really retail. It's really B2B, most of it. But obviously it's the, it's the parents that are the shopper um, and the gatekeeper and it's the kids that are the user. So we need to understand all three levels constantly and understand the dynamics between those as well. Um, so that generates a lot of insights, um, and all those insights then um, is run through what we call pattern recognition, but really to understand what are the patterns in this. And again, knowing the mission we are on as a company, the, the core capabilities we have, and the core DNA, and, and then the strategy, what is it that it's relevant for us to look at? And we use that as background to filter them. And that creates a number of opportunity spaces that then again help set clear direction for the innovation. These are the directions that we should pursue, and, and, though, and these we do not. And again, it's about creating focus for the innovation. You don't want to spread out your resources too, too broad across on too many different areas. So really create focus. And only with, with that foundation in place, ideas are then explored. And here we also did a lot to understand how to, how to be better at prototyping. 
So not creating prototypes. A prototype is typically something that an engineer or a designer makes that is almost similar to the real thing. Uh, it's just a little more ugly, but it works. It typically takes a long time to build. A prototype is something that takes very short time to build, and you're basically faking, you're pretending to have a prototype. And this is an example from IDEO, where they had to do um, an app for, um, for kids, for a client. And instead of hiring in a number of coders and start building the app, they printed an iPhone on a foam board, hang it from the ceiling, carved out a hole fitting the screen, and then they put a guy behind it, and she's recording from the laptop while she interacts with him, so when she's poking, he's responding like this. And that's being recorded. It took about an hour, and an hour later, they had kids into the lab and tested that first experience. So within two hours, they already tested their first assumptions. Is this the right direction for this experience, or is it not? And like that, you can, in very few days, test out a lot of, a lot of ideas at a very early stage before you really invested anything in it to understand what are the right directions. And that we do every two weeks. So at Lego we build a two week work cycle, which means that every two weeks, all the teams have to identify the, the key hypothesis they want to test, come up with ideas, prototype these ideas, and test them either in the lab or out um, in schools, et cetera, where the kids are in their homes, and then evaluate and iterate. And that happens every two weeks. So they only have two weeks. And it puts a constraint on how much time you have. It means they're focused, but also means that the projects can't go in the wrong direction for more than maximum two weeks. Then they'll understand, OK, this idea wasn't good, this idea was good. And then they can pursue that further. We partner with a lot of external partners, um, knowing that often we don't have the core capabilities or the capabilities within the organization to pursue this. So we need to partner up with external companies. And we try to make these partnerships non-transactional um, because it's more about joint R&D collaborations. Then when projects reach a certain maturity level, we, we test them in the market. And this is, again, important because you, you need to prove um, that this, this, this can work in a multifaceted context um, in the real world. But again, make those as small as possible. What's the smallest possible way we can get this into the market? It shouldn't take a year of building a pilot. It should take a few months and then getting into the market, maybe just a few stores in one market with one customer. Or maybe it's a closed beta where the world doesn't really know about it. It's per invitation only. So it's really about getting it, not getting it right the first time, but aiming to learn. Because only then you dare to fail. And by keeping these projects small and by testing and validating every two weeks, there is no failing. There's only learning. Um, so failing is not re doesn't really exist. And even the projects that, that at some point didn't go further were a success because they were able to uncover a new territory and, uh, and understand where not to move or how not to do things. So just a case um, to illustrate um, how we use this uh, method and, um, and, and something that we did in exploring new territory. And this was one of my, my first tasks when I started at Lego. And the chance was really that we were seeing more and more fans were creating their own Lego products. So the development of Lego products were being democratized. And why was this? Well, as I told before, we have millions of adult fans. And these fans can think up their own ideas for products and services that Lego isn't doing, but there's a market for it. And maybe it's not scalable enough for Lego, or maybe it doesn't fit into the portfolio, um, et cetera. A lot of reasons. But, um, but the fans are making it. So when you go on Etsy, which is the world's largest online site for homemade products, you'll find thousands and thousands of products that are clearly looking and feeling like Lego, but made by fans and sold to other fans, or just in, in general to consumers. And half of them are clearly infringing the brand. So um, my one of my first meetings on this was actually uh, with legal to understand, so what do we do? And they say, well, we could probably do something about this, but it would take you know, 500 lawyers, five years, and most likely will be killing the brand while doing it. So I said, well, if we can't you know, beat them, let's, let's join them. How do we collaborate with these fans? They, they're basically just celebrating the brand. The first thing we did was to reach out to some of the most successful of those entrepreneurs that were doing quite successful businesses. And it was across a lot of different areas, jewelry, um, modern arms, uh, architecture, um, technology, um, events, arts, a lot of different things. And we said, well, 
guys, if you're willing to follow these simple uh, guidelines, let's say don't harm any children in what you're doing, etc., um, then we will uh, license you the, the, um, the use of the brand at no cost. And we called it the, the Lego Certified Professionals Program, which meant that these guys now got permission to operate, but they had to follow these guidelines. And they are now the amb ambassadors for the, um, for the whole fan community, and they help the rest of the community to, to do things in a Lego value way and to follow those guidelines. But it wasn't really scalable enough. There were about 200 of them. So the second thing we did was to create Lego Ideas. Lego Ideas is basically a crowdsourcing platform on which you can come up with your Lego product idea. Um, but Lego won't look at these ideas because there are millions of them. Um, instead, the community has to look at them. And an idea has to gather minimum 10,000 supporters for Lego to look at it. And a supporter is a um, person that's willing to buy the product at a specific price point if launched. And every year, Lego is committed to launching three to four projects from this platform um, as a full launch in the market. Um, but when we came up with this idea, um, the company was completely against it. They said, no way, we're not going to do this. It's too risky. And um, first and foremost, we have our own designers. They know better. You know, they're brilliant. They're skilled. Why should we have the community do this? And secondly, the competition can look over our shoulder. We shouldn't do it. But then we were allowed to do a small pilot of it. And we picked out the, the Japanese market because of the language barrier and isolation. But it was also an old, well-established Lego market. And we launched what was called Lego Kuso. And we didn't create it ourselves. We had a third party created under their brand simply just to test it with an arm's length. How does this work? Um, Kuso means wish in Japanese. So it was, it was launched and tested there. And the first product to come out on this platform was this called the Shinkai. It's a real um, engineer-built submarine um, in Japan and sort of a pride of the nation. It's the only submarine in the world that can go down to six kilometers depth manned. So it was launched. It was one of the engineers that, that came up with the idea. We launched it in the market and be became quite quickly the best-selling um, product that we ever had in that market within that price point because it sort of reached into a, a, a community of highly passionate people and had a very high conversion rate. So that pr proved the platform and the operating model as well. So we decided to give 1% back of the turnover to the idea ideator um, as part of the operating model. So then we launched the international platform. And we were looking for um, a great case, a great product to be the first one. And we were lucky because the first one was Lego Minecraft. And how many of you know Minecraft? Right, so it's an, it's an online digital game where you're built with, physical, where you're built with blocks, digital blocks, quite like Lego, but just digital. And this was sort of the bricks to go with your digital game. And there was one of the fans putting it on there. We were looking for 10,000 supporters, and in 24 hours, it got 400,000 supporters. The servers actually crashed three times during this. We, we had no way to participate in this. We launched it six months later, only in the online store of uh, the small Swedish company behind uh, Minecraft. And it sold in the millions with zero marketing because it was an 80 million large community that it tapped into with a very high conversion rate. So it became an enormous success. Now it's a full product line. And for the last three years, it's been in the top three of growth drivers for the company, an entirely new IP that I'm sure we would never have discovered if it hadn't been because of this platform. So it really proved the platform is not only a great, a great engagement tool, it's really a growth driver for the company. Having fans help us create and identify opportunities for us. Uh, many other products have come out. If you notice these two, Back to the Future and Ghostbusters, when they were launched, no adults, no kids knew what that was. So these were only for adults, but still very successful because it was such big community, fan communities that these reached. So it helped the company not only uh, create a, a platform that was strong, but also to understand how it can open more up. So this, this helped with a cultural transformation within the organization in understanding how to address open innovation and set sort of the strategy for the open innovation value pools for the company. So the results of this was really to build know-how, capability, and culture ahead of time and understanding how can we open up as an organization, how can we venture into these areas, how can we better collaborate with the ecosystem, with the community uh, um, uh, to create value in the future. So summing up, Key challenges with entrepreneurship. First one is to prove it. And here we learned you need to launch it. You need to test it in the market. PowerPoint slides and spreadsheets just won't cut it. It'll be killed uh, and again and again. 
So you need to launch it, but do it small and quick and fast. Second is how to internalize it. And there we learned you need to build it on the, exist, on, on the core DNA of what is a legal experience. If you can always recognize that in, in each new radical project, then it will be internalized, then it won't be rejected. And finally, how to scale it. And there we had a hard learning because when we, when we um, launched Future Lab, we, we started by making it the most secret remote lab in the organization and needed a special security card to get in. And that completely backfired because the rest of the organization started hating us and there was, um, there was too much distance. So now it's the most open lab in the organization, both inside and outside, which means that every two weeks we invite um, the whole organization or, or select the key stakeholders across the value chain to come in and be part of what we call demo days, where they can see the Octi prototypes and be part of it. And the key advantage is that not only do we get great input and advice from these guys, but over time they start adapting to the ideas. They start um, stealing with pride. They start to understand this new future. And that means they start building capabilities for the future that then enables scaling later on. So finally, um, my recommendation to you guys is go on, be a rebel, um, but be diplomatic about it. You know, it's easy to set things on fire. It's harder to get people to follow once you've got a great idea. So here's the top five advice on self-disruption. The first one is that people will hate your project, accept it. So there will be resistance. Um, this is natural because people will feel fear about the unknown, what happens to me and my position and my capabilities if this new thing really takes off. Second is to understand the rules that you're breaking. You will be breaking rules, but understand why they were there in the first place, to understand the past and the legacy, but also to understand what, whose toes are you stepping on so you can pick these people up as you move forward. Because you need to build a tribe and get more and more people behind as you move forward with your project. Invite them in. We do that through writing love letters, quite literally, meaning being very diplomatic and humble, knowing that you're standing on the shoulders of giants, sort of looking into the future, and it's the existing core business paying your salary today, so be respectful of that. And finally, make other people shine. This will make them come back for more um, if, you, if you share the wins and the spoils. So it's about being diplomatic rebels. All right, thank you guys. <laughs>